Is that live sound? Okay, good. We good? All right, thanks. So sorry for that um, little glitch at the beginning. Today's going to be a glitchy day, but glitchy days are kind of fun. Um, so this is, um, like sometimes you get motivated to do work because you get annoyed over and over again. So I kind of got annoyed over and over again with just some little stupid things, um, and it turned into this project. But along the way, I learned a lot of things, and I wanted to share those things with you because I think it's, um, you'll see, I think it's interesting. So the um, talk is Which Way is Inbound? Journey with SF Muni and Directional Statistics. Uh, my name's Eric Theis. Um, I do sort of straightforward workshops about geo stuff, and then I do like oddball talks like this one. So Muni, um, for those of you, how many people are from San Francisco? And have spent some or have spent some time. Okay, good. So a lot of you who are not from here, um, Muni is the city transit organization. I mean, it actually has changed names in some ways, but basically people refer to it as Muni, and it's not BART because BART is regional transit that goes across the bay and comes down here to the airport and those sorts of things. Uh, and it's not Caltrain, which is also a form of regional transit. So this is our buses and our streetcars, which go underground and sort of become a subway and then pop out again at another place. Um, and this is the route map, and actually, I don't know if Will Score is here, but he was like, wow, your routes go everywhere, and it's true. The coverage is really excellent. Um, when the bus will come is more of an issue in practical living in San Francisco, and whether it comes with two empty ones following it or in a nicely organized way is a different matter. But anyway, we're not going to snark too much about Muni today. Schedules anyway, um, but anyway, it covers the whole city. You can get a lot of places, and really, some of the routes are amazingly well thought out. You're like, how am I ever going to get from here to here? And you look and like, oh my gosh, there's a route that goes within a few blocks of both ends of that trip. So it's kind of great that way. Um, this, is turning out okay. Yeah, this is where I live. Uh, I live up above the Castro, kind of in the center of San Francisco, and this thing here is the 33 Stanyon. That's that's my limo. <laughs> um, it takes me down the hill to, I can get to the BART station that I took here, so I took this bus today. Uh, I used to work somewhere where it took me. I mean, it's a great bus. Uh, it's a friendly bus. I know a lot of people who ride it. I actually know a few of the bus drivers by names. And they used to play in punk bands in the 70s and all, all sorts of great stuff. Um, but the bus does this crazy turn in front of my house here, often blocks traffic badly. And it's an electric bus, so sometimes these things flop off, and then it stalls out. And it's total chaos. But the re main reason I'm showing you this is not to brag about my view, but <laughs> here's the bus. Here's the 33. That's downtown. By anybody's measure, there's the Transamerica Pyramid and Bank of America building, all those kinds of things. Um, and Muni names its routes inbound and outbound. So at least where I come from, inbound would mean like that way. But for this particular route, inbound is like kind of where you're sitting over there, and outbound is on the other side of this hill. Because it's sort of a circular route, and that's fine, and it's a great route, and it gets you a lot of places. But the whole notion of inbound and outbound is kind of crazy in a situation like this, at least to me, where inbound means downtown-ish, and outbound means away from downtown. So I was kind of curious how many other of the routes suffered from this. Um, part of the reason this is important, I mean, it's not, look, nobody's life is going to end if you get the inbound and outbound thing wrong. but. Um, Sometimes you're faced with being up really early in the morning, like 4.30, wondering if the bus is even running yet, trying to figure out when it's going to show up, and going, oh, God, which, which one's inbound now? <laughs> the wrong direction that way or the wrong direction that way? This is the transit planner that a lot of us use, transit511.org. Um, and it, even though it explains sort of the destinations of these places, outbound to General Hospital or inbound to the Richmond, um, you still have to make a choice of inbound and outbound to get the schedule and figure out when the bus is going to come if you're planning for an early departure. Um, otherwise, there are live things that will help you. But this is, this is one of the ways the inbound and outbound nomenclature is used that can be kind of confusing. Um, and in fact, I'm not alone in this. You know, here's somebody who asked a question a long time ago, which side do I stand on, SF Muni, outbound or inbound? New to the city, what do I do? And this person's actually talking about the underground, the subway part of the system. And people kind of kick in with opinions. Um, and they do work generally. For, they worked for the routes as they existed at this time. There's a new route for which this does not work. And it doesn't work for the buses at all. Actually, the last time I gave this talk, I just found this. And it was like, oh, that's a good thing. And I was thinking about it. Like, no, that's not right. And then it screwed me up when I gave the talk wrong. So it's kind of perplexing for people. So um, inbound, outbound, kind of confusing in a lot of cases. Um, so I kind of looked to figure out maybe it's me. Maybe I got a problem with inbound. 
Um, so I looked up some definitions, and apparently it comes from ships, navigation. So when they're coming home or into port, they're inbound. Otherwise, they're outbound, which makes sense. Um, they define it in terms of inward, and inward is defined in terms of inside, interior, center as of a place. And OK, center of a place makes sense to me as a city. Um, when San Francisco was first being settled, um, this is a place called Portsmouth Square. And Portsmouth Square was close to the water, which it isn't anymore because of landfill. Um, and it was basically the center of San Francisco. People sort of built around there or further away, but this was sort of thought of as the center. Um, it has, you know, it got bigger and built up even in this stereo view, which is old and historic. And at this point, um, it's still a park in Chinatown or near Chinatown, on the edge of Chinatown. Um, but they built a giant underground parking lot there, so the park's not as nice as it looks here. Um, but people do, do use it extensively. You'll find people playing chess and Go and other sorts of games in the park. Um, so Portsmouth Square sort of make, made uh, sense as a center, and you would think that might be a, a good direction for inbound. Um, let me show you some other routes. This is a 38 Geary, um, which is a very popular route. And it's kind of a classic inbound, outbound route. Um, it goes downtown, as you can see on the right. Again, I don't know how, you, how well you know San Francisco. So maybe I'll walk over and point out a few things. But basically, you know, the place I was talking about, Portsmouth Square, was here. Ferry building is here for a lot of terminals. There's public transit terminal here for many buses that go into the East Bay over to Oakland and Berkeley. Um, and then these are our neighborhoods, our lovely Golden Gate Park and so on. You should really all stay after the conference and check the place out. It's a really nice, nice place. But anyway, um, outbound is a straight shot to the ocean, which makes sense to me. That's the Richmond neighborhood. Inbound makes sense to downtown. So I got no issues with the 38. I know which side of the street to use when I get on that bus. Um, there's a somewhat obscure bus that goes to Treasure Island. People don't really know that much about Treasure Island, but um, this bus makes sense too. Inbound is from the island to the mainland or to the peninsula. Uh, outbound is back to the island. But then again, there's the 33, which I mentioned, which has this kind of meandering route um, starting up there in the left. I don't even know, starting is not even correct, but like out, out there and then coming down, down here. So you can see how it kind of travels in a radius almost from the center of the city. So I thought, you know, I mean, I could, I could look at each route piece by piece and just get an opinion about how good I thought it was. And it's like, well, that's not, you know, I'm a PhD in operations research and I took a bunch of statistics. There must be some way to actually quantify this and say this one is inbound for sure. <laughs> and this one is not inbound for sure. Um, and I thought, well, there must be some statistics on bearing. Like bearing is what I think of like in terms of where I'm headed or the expression we have, get your bearings, you know, like know where you are and which way you're headed. So it's kind of curious if there were stats on bearings. And in fact, it turns out there's a field that has developed, unfortunately, since I was in graduate school, um, so I didn't learn about it, um, that's called sometimes directional statistics and sometimes circular statistics. And it gives you what you want. Um, it gives you a notion of mean direction, so like an average way you're traveling. And as with all statistics where it's like central tendency and dispersion, um, it also has a notion of circular variance or standard deviation. So um, this sounds like exactly what you need. And because you have those things, you can do hypothesis testing. So it's pretty cool. Um, and there are like, there are hand, there are, I think there's like eight or nine books that have been written about this since the 70s. I mean, actually, the early work was in the 70s, so I, shouldn't, I was not in grad school that long ago. <laughs> but um, some of the, I think the most influential work, or most like substantial work, uh, came out in the late 80s or early 90s. Um, and that one's interesting, probably interesting to a number of you too, because it not only deals with um, circular statistics, it actually extends it to spherical statistics. So these same ideas work on a spherical surface. Um, the math is kind of nasty, but you can do it. So um, just a couple of examples of, of how things work in the circular statistics world. This is a chart um, of some data. These are wind directions, and this is pl pl um, plotting them sort of naively. So we're just plotting observations from 1 to 300 something across the x-axis, and the number of radians in the, the direction of the wind on the y-axis. And if we know our data, we get a sense that there's, okay, there's this sort of band here that's sort of chunky, and this band up here that's kind of chunky, and not so much here. So zero and six radians seem like where most of this stuff is happening. But it's kind of weird because 
well, we'll see in a second. Because if you plot it as a histogram on the left, sort of, again, naively, you're like, oh, I got a bimodal distribution. But in fact, because it's on a circle, um, it cycles back to itself. So a more natural way of plotting it, at least as a histogram this way, would be to put, you know, somehow center it on the mean or median or mode or whatever. Um, and then you get a sense of, yes, that's the com most common direction, and then it kind of falls off from there. So it's a pretty well-behaved distribution, not as apparent in the first picture as left. Your mind has to do that sorting itself to really start making sense of it. Um, and what you get from the field of circular statistics are approaches to plotting that look like this. So R has a package called circular, um, which um, seems to be, there's, there's two circular statistical packages in R, but this is the one that seems to be better documented, maybe more widely used and more actively developed. Um, and so it's a pretty, matter, pretty simple matter to plot things this way. And so this is, again, that same wind data um, arranged around a circle as a histogram, but the wrap is implicit. So um, all the things at six radians and zero radians, which are essentially the same number, um, are up at the top. You see it's a slightly, slightly northeast direction. Um, and then there's this nice rose diagram in the center that kind of replicates it as a, as a blockier histogram, a grouped histogram. So um, anyway, that's some like really basic ideas about what circular statistics do. Um, but I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting advance. And new, you know, like, I don't know. Sort of think statistics doesn't change that much. I'm naive, but it, you know, here's a whole new thing. It's come along in the past 20 years, kind of. Okay, so yeah, so the question is, um, who actually implements this stuff? As I said, it's in R. You can use either the circular or circ stats package. Um, I have not found a Python implementation. I might be wrong, but I, I have not found one. I also have not found a JavaScript implementation, um, although I didn't look everywhere. But um, JSTAT's a common package. Um, simple statistics is something that Tom McWright at uh, Mapbox worked on. It's not in there. Um, and it wasn't in ScienceJS, which is a project that's closely aligned with D3. So um, I normally don't do this. Like I don't. The right answer for me is not normally build your own statistics package from the ground up. Because uh, I don't think that's a good idea, but I did it anyway, kind of, although I didn't actually, it's not really been released. But this is the GitHub page for that thing. Um, it does do, actually, quite a bit of stuff. What's, what's nice about it, if you want to take a look at it and use it, is that it knows about a fair number of distributions. It's got the discrete distributions and continuous distributions, as well as a bunch of helpers. Um, and... Uh, one of the things that it does that I don't know that too many other things do is it, it actually has some random number generation random number generators built in so that you can hook this stuff up to simulations. So if you basically say I want you know 5,000 Poisson distributed variables with certain characteristics, it will do that for you. So that's kind of fun. Um, the 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 directional stuff actually is in an obscure branch and is not actually surfaced in this yet, but the code works for a lot of stuff. So anyway, I don't really recommend. I mean, if you like statistics and you want to remind, remind yourself of how it all works, it's kind of useful, but I probably should have done some other things instead of doing this. Um, so what I'm going to show you basically works uh, through a few steps. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'm going to talk about this. Um, Nextbus is in a lot of cities. I don't remember how many, but quite, you know, dozens and dozens across the United States, and they have uh, an API. <coughs> that's open um, and very, per, I guess you would say permissive. I mean, I think the restriction is that you can only hit it once a second, something like that. So if you're going to, I mean, it's open. So I don't, I don't really use the word scraping when it comes to open APIs. So I mean, if you're accessing the API and downloading data, then you just have to hit it once a second, and they seem cool with that. So not only did I download um, San Francisco data, I downloaded download data from every system they had in the country, although I haven't extended my work beyond that yet. Um, What's interesting about their API, I mean, so their API is really about real-time stuff. It gives you uh, estimated depart, uh, arrival times for routes that are in their system, and that's how most people use it. So a lot of the apps that, you know, around town that, don't, that aren't Transit 511 but are something else and want, you want to know when your 33 is going to come next, they'll use the next bus API. Um, it has a list of all the stops in XML form. Um, <clears throat> it has a route as a sequence of stops. Uh, which is what you need if you're doing real, real serious um, transit stuff. But it also has paths, and paths are great for me because paths 
are just um, visualizations of the route. And they don't include all the stops, they just include the stops where the route changes. Uh, and in a certain way, they're, they're actually better than the route information because the route information doesn't really take, the route information doesn't really snap to the street grid. So if the thing turns, the line of the route will actually cut across the middle of the block, which isn't what you want to show people anyway. And me, mainly, I'm interested in just the lengths of the segments of the route. So the path information is great for me. I don't have to pull down all that data. So I work with the path information that Nextbus provides. Um, I pull that stuff into a PostGIS enabled PostgreSQL database, as many of us do. Um, there's a Python script that then hits that database and turns it into GeoJSON and currently does Currently, the Python is doing the directional statistics that I need, although it's really based on the code that I wrote for the JavaScript library that I showed you. I would like to have it done in the browser at some point, but that's not, that's not working right now, or at least not for this project. So um, that's happening, and then you know, in a GeoJSON way, it, it creates a feature collection per route, and the stats are stored as properties on the GeoJSON um, object. So that's how that works. Oh yeah, this is fun. So I know, well, yeah, I'm not going to say that. Forget that. Um, so the question was, like, ultimately, what am I going to use as the as the as inbound? You know, the golden inbound. What will that be? Um, and if you look at you know definitions around, people want to use a central business district, and we don't technically have a central business district, but people use the financial district, which is a zip code, um, as uh, as the financial district. So. I never really looked at it before, and I plotted it, and I looked for the centroid, and I got it, and I mapped it, and I was like, no. <laughs> no, it's better than Transbay Terminal. <laughs> Are you kidding? It's the best. It's the mechanics monument, all right? So this is where. <laughs> so um, this, is, oh, this, is a, this is a side <laughs> trip, but this is funny. So there is a, a monument that was uh, created for a wealthy industrialist who was favored by the city politicos. Um, and it's moved since it was built. It actually was one of the things that survived the earthquake. It went up, I think, in 1899 or something. Um, and it survived the earthquake. There are actually these kind of devastating photos of it, like surrounded by rubble, but it's okay. And now it's um, really like two meters from the centroid. Um, it was made by a sculptor named Douglas Tilden, who's actually quite an interesting character. He was. Um, he had scarlet fever as a child and was deaf very early on, but he managed to go to Paris and study with another master sculptor and came back to a claim of the Michelangelo of the West. He was one of the accomplished California artists very early in the 20th century. So he got some choice um, commissions. Uh, and this is the, monu the monument. And it's kind of great because it has all the trimmings of what the industrialist was famous for, propellers and big wheels and a giant punch press um, but what people were not really so sure about was like all these burly guys in loincloths <laughs> hanging around on top of this um, punch press. You know, they're feeding metal in there and these other guys are working it. Um, but, you know, like OSHA would not stand for this today. <laughs> so every time I walk by this thing, I crack up. I think it's, 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 it's really quite beautiful and I think it's quite, quite an interesting attempt to like bring Beaux-Arts sculpture into the modern age and try to make sense of doing that. And apparently he was looking around for ideas and walked past some place where there were shirtless people operating this kind of machinery. So it's not completely far-fetched, but you know, these three guys just like pulling down the punch press. It's awesome. Okay. <laughs> so so this is uh, this is this is what I'm gonna show. So this is basically yeah so this is the um, that's our financial district centroid the map. This showing up okay, right? Yeah, good. Um, and some of the routes I've already mentioned, like, well, I didn't actually mention this, but the, the one bus is like the Geary uh, in that it starts out in the Richmond and comes in town. The Geary is sort of parallel to that. And if you look at these things, then the actual mean direction, you know, from north is 81, almost 90 degrees. I mean, basically inbound, it's heading straight east, practically straight east. And the expected mean dir direction, which is calculated based on the route pointing not to where it actually goes, the normals of where it goes, but to the to the centroid of the to the to the, me to the mechanics monument, <laughs> 75 degrees. So there is some variance on that, but um, there's there's no statistical evidence to suggest that this would be different from inbound, which is cool. And the same is true for the uh, for the one California. 
Um, very little variance. If you do a hypothesis test, there's, there's no evidence that it's, any, that it's significantly different. Um, but if you come back to, say, the 33, I should zoom in a bit here, but the actual mean direction is um, a negative 49 degrees, while the expected direction, if it were actually inbound towards the financial district or the mechanics monument, would be 48 degrees. So the variance is, is the variance of the route itself is significant because it makes a lot of turns along the way, but it's um, statistically significantly not inbound. It's kind of what I was looking for. So um, that's basically what the point of the exercise was about. And I have not done this for every single route, um, although I was very close and then some stuff worked out this morning. But um, that is when I'm going to put this to bed. It's basically find the ones that are most, you know, significantly not what they say they are. Um, and then I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. I, I will put this away. I will release my, <laughs> my statistics library and put this away and go find something else to do because it's kind of been occupying my time, but it's fun. Um, and I think, I think people you know, who work, I mean, I don't know. I'm curious to hear from other people. Like I've given this talk, versions of this talk, like three times now. And I always ask if there's anybody in the room who knows more about circular statistics than I do or anything about it because I'm kind of curious to meet people that have worked with this and have other ideas. So if that's you, please ask a question at the end or come up and talk to me at the end. Um, but anyway, I think this is something that would be interesting to add to our toolkit if we are not currently using that anyway. Do I have anything else to say? I got one more San Francisco kind of joke for you. Um, San Francisco, you know, we pride ourselves on everything, right? We're kind of a little snotty. <laughs> um, but we do have a great, oh, I should say, Getting ahead of myself. God, I want to tell this joke so bad. Um, anyway, yes, let's just go to this. Um, so this, this is a famous photo. This is actually not the famous photo, but there was a famous photo shoot in front of City Lights Books, um, which was, is still run by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, one of the beats. And so you've got Allen Ginsberg in there and Peter Olofsky and Michael McClure. All these famous beat writers came together. And even somebody from the next generation, Richard Brout, again, is in there in a white hat, kind of hiding behind somebody. Um, you know, and this... Great literature has come out of San Francisco, both much earlier than this and to the, to the day. But we don't credit Muni for its literary uh, and linguistic inventions. Uh, Muni has this great sentence that appears on all of its buses and trains, which is basically like this beautiful passive aggressive, we're not going to help you <laughs> unless we feel like it. And um, I'll end here. This is not my approach to questions. I will answer your questions. I will. <laughs> I will even have some unnecessary conversation if you would like. So um, <laughs> I think that's it. So thanks for humoring me. <laughs>
Oh, we're, call, we're taking requests. Okay, which one? <laughs> 36. 36 isn't on here. Oh, 30, oh my, huh, my numbers are weird. I thought I had all my JavaScript stuff. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty squirrely one. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, the variance is 0.67. I think there's one that's bigger. I think there's one where the variance is actually 0.8. I just don't recall which one it is. Is that a 24? 24 is 24 not that bad. 37.76. <laughs> yeah, this one, this one runs in my neighborhood, too. I mean, the thing is, you know, what we have in San Francisco is is hills and mountains and things kind of route around that, Sp particularly if you're on a bicycle. But even the buses need to take account of this. Uh, and the people who live up there are not as well served. So um, yeah, the Corbett is a great bus. It goes all these interesting places, often not on time, but it definitely can give you an interesting tour of Twin Peaks if you're up that way. Although it's more fun on foot. I've got to tell you, more fun on foot. Other questions? Eric. So historically, the 33 ended at Fort and Harrison um, rather than Really? Sarasota. When was that? Um, Huh. Um, so, but we make it even weirder that the, that the, that the outbound would be along the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what Eric's saying. Yeah, I haven't I haven't done that much. Um, I haven't done any really historical. I just worked with the contemporary routes, and I've not updated it to include some of the new routes that came out this year. But what Eric's saying is that what's interesting. He's saying that this the bus I ride, the 33, used to go to Fourth and Harrison, which would be around here. Which is a lot closer to here. That's that's really seems inbound. Like if from the photograph from my front view, like that would actually make total sense as inbound. But inbound is here, and outbound is here. So at that time, it would have been outbound, or maybe they switched it. I don't know. Yeah, it's. I love it. <laughs> yeah, true. This is my geo breakfast crowd back here. <laughs> I should apologize for we didn't mean to be the peanut gallery. No, no, no. We were very impressed with your hearing. <laughs> um, uh, so I, my understanding is the, the trend in transit network design these days is to go for grids of high frequency to allow transfers. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you given your, your toolkit of um, circular statistics, what would you be looking for as signs of, of uh, not just a single route, but a productive network that can allow for, for transfers between multiple lines? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I mean, I think grids, Departure from grids or departure from straight lines are pretty easy to identify with this. I mean, you, you could either, I mean, there's, there's, you've probably seen this work. I mean, there's interesting work of people who've decomposed San Francisco into like seven grids, you know, where they each, like, like the Richmond, actually probably the, all the outer, outer lands make sense as a grid, but then, you know, the mission makes sense as a grid from here to here, and, and, or, you know, South Market makes sense as one grid, and this is a grid, and then you get into the hills, and that's where it kind of falls apart. So I think within those individual grids, you could tell departure from the grid, you know, as it started to go up a hill or something, by a change, significant change in, in direction. Um, and that might be an interesting place to look at a transfer point. This is like totally unprovoked, but I mean, one of the, one, you know, one of, one of the things that's really consistently terrible about Muni is, you know, the, the underground basically, it sort of starts out here and runs underneath Twin Peaks and then it just goes underneath Market Street. Um, and at, all, at that point, and at that point, and at one side route, it's fed by the same vehicles that are basically running on the streets. So it's like a kind of a light rail, and then it goes into the subway. Um, and it always seemed to me that they should basically run the subway as a separate thing that just runs back and forth, and that when these other lines come in, people should just get off and transfer to that because the subway then would be easier to control and would not have to interface with the irregularities of things that are out on the street grid. So. I don't know if this, if this would help me look at that either, but that, that always struck me as, because it's, it's, it's for, you know, you go down there and you're like, hey, maybe today is gonna be the good day. Like maybe today I'll go down to the station and there won't be 50 people standing there and the train's 10 minutes and by the time the train comes, like there's just no way. I mean, it looks like Tokyo, but it's not Tokyo. It's San Francisco, seven miles square, you know, shouldn't be that hard except for the hills. Sorry, Muni. <laughs> yeah, Gary. Uh, 
right? Right. That you wouldn't expect. Right. Right. So what would be a yeah. good way of describing a route to somebody who maybe doesn't know the city so well? Right. You know, not in terms of inbound and outbound, not in terms of permanences, but I guess in terms of the, the route itself. Yeah. 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 No, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Color well, works. Yeah. Color just removes yourself from the landscape, and you just know it's the red line. Yeah. But yeah, or or, or neighborhoods traverse. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. So other cities in the world do it completely different. Okay. So for example, put the number, and for example, most cities put the number, the route, that define the route as a number, but the actual name you see that is that number, whatever, one, two, three, mm -hmm. then the name of the neighborhood or the landmark or whatever is shown. So uh, one route would be Chinatown, like route one, two, three is Chinatown or route one, two, three for Trevor Hill. Because it's a route that whole goes from, so you know the direction explicitly. Yeah. The name of the route and the name of the name, so it's an explicitly differentiation. Yeah. So use it, we use it in neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood or landmark or yeah. you know or other things, but yeah. it's, that doesn't solve the problem of the guy that doesn't know the city. Yeah. Right. And then use the map. Yeah. It needs a map. I mean, again, you gotta have to use the map. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, that's good. I mean, the thing is also San Francisco being small and having so many hills and having so many real estate agents that <laughs> there's a lot of neighborhoods and there are new neighborhoods every couple of weeks as people are trying to sell something different. And like, like we didn't have Nopa before, which is north of the Panhandle, and now we have Nopa, which is more desirable than the Western Edition in the real estate world. Or it's a new thing, so you can sell it differently. But anyway, the 33 like goes through, um, you know, sort of Potrero Hill, the Mission, Castro. Coal Valley, uh, and into the um, inner Richmond. So anyway, yeah, it's complicated. I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't have any answers, but it's just kind of a curious thing to play with. Yeah, one more question, I guess? Uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I was just wondering, should anybody ever change their inbound versus outbound while going the same direction, or is it? I'm not really, Eric, do you know the KT? I, I Yeah, I mean a lot of the a lot of the subways get to the get to uh, the Embarcadero and just go back. But there's a newish one. So in, in a recently reasonably new line is the T, which comes down here, and then runs down Third Street all the way out here. Um, and I think that's inbound to here, and then it's still called inbound as you go out here, as you're heading directly away from downtown. <laughs> yeah. So that one seems like totally crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the big question is, did it have to make sense? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's... Direction, I mean, just call A and B and... Yeah. Right, it's, at some point, it probably loses... What I mean is, at some point, it, it loses, you know, the actual meaning. It's, yeah. You know. I think it just, it needs to be, it needs to be decodable by, by a passenger. I don't know. From, I'm talking, of course, but from yeah. that point of view, from yeah. the Yeah, yeah. So when this, this finally comes up, because you know, I work for a state agency, and um, originally they were looking at buses being beautiful downtown, so they might offer make perfect sense. And of course, they start adding cost time releases. Their system already has a concept that it's on up on, so they have to put that on there. Mm. So that doesn't make sense enough, because mm. that's probably the way the system. Yeah, there's a field for it. <laughs> right, right. Down to whatever downtown is, that it 
to get the minimum point of each extremity to that point inbound and downbound, inbound and outbound would, could make sense. So inbound is the one that has the extremity closest to, yeah. to downtown. Yeah, I have so thought of looking at that. So I'll go look at that. That's a good yeah, idea. It could be some, you know, it's a, it would be an easy rule and it works or doesn't work. And it's, yeah, you know. although it still oh. probably doesn't help the, the, the person. No, no, it doesn't help at all. <laughs> <laughs> behind the desk, a guy yeah. to give the name inbound and outbound would be yeah. an easy rule. Okay, which find is closer to this one. Yeah. 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 So. That may be actually what's happening. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, should I? Who's my are you, you're my timekeeper, right? How am I doing? Um, yes, that's break time now. So. Okay. Any last questions or burning questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you. This is fun. It's a fun stuff. So, great. Thank you all.